You know, so a part of being a pastor or preparing to be a minister, at least in our tradition, usually involves getting some form of a formal education. So for me, right after college, I went to grad school and got a Master of Arts in uh, an MA in the Bible. So I, I have a certificate, to be honest, I lost it, but uh, it says that I mastered the art of studying the Bible, which is fine, I guess. Like, sure I did. And uh, then after that, I went to seminary, and this is kind of funny. Does anybody here know the name of the advanced three- to four-year seminary degree that most pastors get? Anyone know the name of it? Isn't that funny? <laughs> like, most pastors uh, get an MDiv, which stands for Master of Divinity, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, because when you go to seminary, right, apparently you get a certificate that says you have mastered God. Is, is that how it works? Um, uh, I, I have a certificate that's on my wall, and it's a lie. Like, uh, I have not in any sense mastered God. Like, I, I may have mastered the material about theology. I may have had to read way too much. I, uh, I, I do know a little bit about Christianity, but the very first thing that you learn about God is that the more you master the material, the more you study, the more you learn that you have no chance of mastering divinity. Like God is bigger than anything you could even begin to understand in this lifetime. God is bigger than anything that you could learn in eternity, in fact. Now, here's what you need to know. This is about knowing God. The more you know God, the more often you have these moments where you're surprised by him, the more you learn, in fact, about yourself, about the complexity in your own heart and the mess in the world, the more time that you spend contemplating how big God must be. As you look at his attributes, you, you never master God. You just get more and more surprised the more you learn about him, by God's mercy, by Jesus' kindness and love and, and by the comfort of the Spirit. Meeting Jesus involves being freshly surprised by who God is. You, you never completely see how big God is. I mean, the God is somehow big enough to have a plan for all this, but here's what I've learned. The more you learn about yourself and God, the more shocking it becomes that Jesus communes with us, that Jesus, as a kid's song used to say, that Jesus loves even me. Now, today's story is about a religious expert. He had a stack of degrees, or he would have. He really thought that he mastered divinity. He was known as an expert in God. But one day, he gets the shock of his life when he, someone who thought he knew God his whole life, meets Jesus. And finally, after knowing so much about God for so long, he meets Jesus and connects with God maybe for the first time in his life. And what's funny about the, this series of uh, sermons that we've got, when most of us think about people who really need to hear and uh, hear about Jesus, who needs to meet God, we think about someone who doesn't know anything about the Bible or God. But so far we've looked at five different stories about people who thought that they met Jesus in fact, they all think they're following the Lord, and they are each shocked when they discover in a fresh way how big God is and how much Jesus loves them. And I'm so excited about this story because I am convinced that what God wants for many of us today, this very morning, is to be shocked, as if we get blinded by an unmistakable light to see who God actually is. Because even if you've even raised with God, even if you think you know God, you have not mastered all there is to know about God. And I just wonder if God just, just wants to shock us this morning by his goodness and by how much he loves us. And today is the, the last study. Uh, we're looking at people meeting the Lord. We're going to uh, go to the book of Acts to the conversion of St. Paul also known as uh, Saul in different languages. Be before we jump in, uh, just one logistical note. Normally, I put a bunch of information on the screen behind me or in front of me 
and Ed does such a good job keeping up, but this morning there is so much uh, valuable information and verses and questions, I, I could not fit it on the screen without being distracting. So if you're here in person, you'll see a sermon handout. It looks like this in your bulletin. If you're online, you'll see a link. I think it's in the video feeds and also at www.goshen.church slash live. You'll see a big orange button. There's a, there's a handout with some, I'm just some amazing verses and some really thought-provoking questions. I want to encourage you to take this sheet and look at it. If not during the sermon, take it home, spend some time just digesting this. But let me, let me just tell you the story. The story of a religious expert, a master of divinity, meeting God. Here's a story. As Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the voice replies. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now here's what you need to know about Saul. You find this out from a bunch of other passages. He had mastered divinity. And you could read about him. Saul, Paul, was a professor. He had spent his entire life, like from being a toddler on, learning about scripture and theology. And he was really convinced, being raised this way, that he knew exactly what God was like and what God wasn't like. He was a religious expert. For example, he knew things like God couldn't possibly be a human being. So all this stuff about Jesus couldn't possibly true, is what he thought. Saul had also heard Stephen's final speech. You saw us a couple of chapters earlier, where, where he heard a Christian say outrageous things, like the temple, the priesthood, all the sacrifices were all going to be made obsolete by a risen Jesus, and Paul thought this was unthinkable. He knows God. God would never do that. Now, he was a master of divinity. He knew that God was a God who favored and blessed people who uh, were highly religious. God loved disciplined, well-behaved people like himself. And he believed in a God who blessed people, but only people who followed all the rules and regulations to the letter. And Paul's best work, the biggest thing that he could do in serving the God he thought he knew, was to bring judgment on people who were breaking God's rules. So the irony of it was that Paul was busy persecuting Christians because that's what he believed God wanted him to do. What makes him like us is that he believed naturally. He imagined God to be well, a lot like himself. God just happened to like the people that Paul liked and disliked, don't be shocked, the people that Paul disliked. And this is just maybe something natural about people. I, I think we all do this. We all very naturally, as we think about God, as we fill in the blanks about things we don't know, we all naturally create God in our own image. We don't even think about it. We, we just sort of go, Okay, uh, there's a lot I don't know about God, but what would a all-powerful being do? And we fill in those blanks with, well, exactly what I would do. God must be like I would be if I were God, which explains why you've got some people who think about God and worship him as a judgmental, angry divinity who smites the immoral and worldly folks and there are lots of people who think they've met a wrathful, judgmental God who's angry about so many things. Who is God? Well, God is so angry about, this might be a coincidence, exactly the same things that I'm angry about. <laughs> like, that's how a lot of people view God. Of course, other people, they, uh, they don't imagine God like that. They imagine God is very tolerant, very happy, who just embraces people and judges nobody. A lot of people imagine God as sort of a hippie Jesus sort of character, and we all do this. We imagine God to be a lot like us. That's what Paul did until something happens. 
until we meet Jesus. And there's lots of different ways it looks like. Sometimes it looks like God whispering to us like Mary. Sometimes it looks like an incredible life event like Paul. Sometimes it looks like seeing God through the Spirit in Scripture. But what happens when you meet Jesus is that your natural assumptions are challenged. And what you'll find when you really meet Jesus is a God that we modern people would never invent. Like, check out some of these bullet points. Like, when you get a picture of God from Scripture, you discover a God who, on one hand, God is just so holy. I mean, verses like Exodus 6, verse 7, says, God cannot overlook sin and guilt. Like, we wish God would just overlook stuff that I do, right? But God is, well, in Deuteronomy and Hebrews, God is a consuming fire. He's holy. Or Galatians points out, Galatians 3 points out how this holiness and his love, the tension is resolved. I'm not going to read the verse for you, but essentially because God is so holy and so just, you know, equity demands that somebody gets punished for sin. And Galatians explains that someone did get punished for my sin. Jesus died so that we get the blessings that Jesus earns. And it's only by our Savior with his nail-printed hands, still visible. That's why he could come to you and say, you feel condemned, but you're not. If you feel worthless, you're, you're not. Jesus died for you. Like, this is the God who we meet, this amazing God who is not a product of our wishful thinking. Like, we, we wouldn't invent a God like this. He's real to meet us and change us into something us, else. Now, back to the text. When Paul says, Lord, who are you? When he hears God saying, I am Jesus, it just blows his mind. Because he realizes in that moment that everything that he learned about God so far, he was wrong. Everything he imagined God to be like, he got challenged. Now, he, he had this, up till this point, he saw in the Bible a collection of laws and stories about morality that tell people exactly how to live in order to get blessed by God. So there he is, he thinks of God as a deal maker of some sort. As if God goes, if you want a good life, here's what you got to do. But when he meets Jesus... He, he just, I mean, it changed how he reads the entire scriptures. All of a sudden, the Bible's pointing to Jesus, and it changed how he reads everything. Like the Bible, how a lot of us find God. This is, this is not a book about Aesop's fables, like telling us how to live a good life. And the Bible ultimately points to Jesus. It's a story about how God brings salvation into the world in ways that climax in us being united with Christ. And when Paul all of a sudden goes, who in the world are you, Lord? Like he's shocked again because Jesus says twice, I, I am the one who you are persecuting, which would have raised a lot of questions. Like how, um, how could this blinding figure be somebody who Paul was trying to put in prison? Like Paul would have never thought this. Like, Jesus could have said a bunch of things. Paul could have said, why are you persecuting them, them Christians? Right, that would have made sense. But he said, why are you persecuting me? Now, Tim Keller points out, and you're hearing quite a bit of his influence today, but he says in those first words, when Jesus says, you are persecuting me, there's just an insight so profound that those words changed and shocked everything about what Paul thought. Like, you see what's going on here, right? Paul is on a mission to imprison what he thinks is misguided followers of a dead guy. And Jesus says, those people are actually me, which is interesting. But it says that being a Christian isn't just about adopting a set of beliefs or practices being a Christian isn't about following a set of rules or regulations. It's not even just about belief or faith. Christianity is about being really close to Jesus. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, he says. 
Uh, which is to say Jesus is claiming such intimate relationship with his people. Like, who, Jesus claims to be being persecuted as Jesus' followers are being persecuted, which says that for Paul to persecute Christians is to attack Christ. You can understand why Paul's confused, right? In that sentence, Jesus points out that Christians, followers of Jesus, people who just believe in Jesus, are connected to Jesus in such a powerful, inseparable way that to persecute a Christian is to attack Jesus. And this goes throughout Paul's letters everywhere. Like, when you read what Paul writes, I I think it's about 160 times Paul talks about Christians as our identity is being in Christ. So something like, you have right in front of you, Romans 6, Paul says, this will make you think, Paul says, we died and we were buried with him. Think about that for a second. That's close. Or Ephesians 2, when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and seeth the right hand of God, Romans, uh, Ephesians says, God raised us up and seated us up. Like, what happens to one happens to the other. We are that close to Jesus. Romans says we are justified with with, by faith. And you could use uh, more complicated words like union with Christ and meeting Jesus. Uh, it doesn't just, being a Christian doesn't just change what you do or even how you think. It fundamentally changes who you are. You are the body of Christ. That's an identity thing, which changes what you do. And Paul, again, to go through his verses, Paul isn't just talking about something that happens in the future. He says, you died and were, past tense, buried. you got to think about that for a while. What Paul says is that when you're a Christian, it means that you are so close to Jesus that when Jesus died, was raised, and ascended to heaven, and Paul says it it happened to you too in a way, which is, you got to think about that. It's symbolized, of course, in the act of communion, but this is how close you are. You take the body and blood of Christ, and are somehow connected to Jesus. Now let me get a little bit technical for a minute. The first effect that has on you is that, again, this is a little theological, but I'll use the word uh, legally. Uh, Another term would be forensic justification. One thing that happens when you're really close to Jesus, it means that you Well, I'll say this, the judge, God, judges us on the behalf of Jesus' actions. So you look at your own self and you think about what you deserve in terms of punishment. You examine your life, you read the Ten Commandments and think about all the times you've been angry or all the times you've said things you you wish you could take back and you, you see how holy God is and you know deep down you don't deserve anything good from God. Being close to Jesus, though, means that Jesus paid it all. As Romans 3 says, we are justified that for every punishment you deserve, God gives, well, God put the punishment on Jesus. It is as Romans, or Philippians 3 says, we are seen as perfectly righteous in Christ. Which is, I mean, think about this. Let this sink in. God looks at each of us with all of my failures with all the ways that I have fallen short of God's standards. And Christians are so close to Jesus that God treats me as if I accomplished everything that Jesus accomplished. God gives you the wages for Jesus' actions. You, you get blessed because God the Father loves God the Son. We could, this gets deep. We could talk about this for a while. But I, I, I want to move on because being connected to Christ isn't just about the blessings you receive instead of punishment. It also changes your life. Like when you read Acts 9, the Holy Spirit shows up and comes on Paul when he was converted. And the Holy Spirit comes on us too. Like being close to Jesus, connecting, being the body of Christ changes your life. Second Peter um, Man, you got to sit and think about this one for a while. 2 Peter 1.4 says, We have become 
partakers in God's divine nature. Think about that for a second, which is, you got to chase this down, but it means that in a way you have communion with Christ in the same way as a hand is connected by a nervous system to the, to the head. We are, and we say this, it's a bit of a cliche, but it's true. You are the hands and feet of Jesus. You are so close to Christ that you are the body of Christ. I, I can't overstate the closeness that Christians have with Christ. But David Martin Lloyd-Jones said, uh, he illustrated this way. He would ask people at church, are you a Christian? And people would often respond, well, I'm trying really hard. But what Martin Lloyd-Jones said right away was, you know, if, um, if people said they're trying really hard, it means they just, they don't understand what it means to be a Christian. Christianity, he said, it's not, it's not a lifestyle that you try and follow. It's not, a, it's not a list of things you do. It's a status. He said it's sort of like being adopted. You're either adopted or you're not. If you're in an orphanage and you're trying to be adopted, you're not adopted. He says it's like being married. Uh, you're either married or you're not married. If, uh, if you're trying to be married, you're not married. Like That's just how it works, right? Christianity is not the reward you get based on how hard you're working at stuff. It's not a work in progress. You're either adopted or not. You're either married or not. You're either a Christian or you're not. And if you are, it changes who you are. More than 200 years ago, during the Great Awakening, uh, 18th century British pastors in a, in a culture where everybody basically went to church, their mission was challenging people who thought they were Christians to act that way. So you had great preachers walking around going, are you just going through the motions or are you spiritually alive? They asked people who went to church their whole life, thought they knew Jesus, asked things like, do you really know Jesus or do you just know a lot of hymns? And as crazy as it sounds, 270 years ago or so, they went to people's houses in what we'd call small groups. And like, this is crazy. The pastors gave out questions to go around groups in people's houses and basically to ask, how real has God been in your heart this week? How, um, how vivid is your vision of God's forgiveness and love? I, I put in your handout, these are some, like, these questions are well over 200 years old. The language has changed a little bit, but they're worth asking. I'm just going to read these. Before the first great awakening, they encouraged people to ask these very questions. Questions that I want you to ask yourself, especially as we approach communion. Are you having any particular seasons of delight in God? This week, do you really sense the presence of God in your life? This week, like this is an easy question to answer. Have you been able to sense Jesus loving you? Or have you been too busy? Have you been too distracted? too tempted to even think about God? Have you found scripture to be alive and active? Or are you able to find certain biblical promises to be precious and encouraging? If so, like which ones? Share with people. Are you finding that God is challenging you or calling you to do something in his word? If so, what, what is God asking you to do this week? Have you been freed to see and admit all the different ways that you sin against God and others? Can you even see yourself? And as you start to see your own sinfulness, is God's grace also becoming more glorious, moving, and comforting? These are really helpful diagnostic questions from over 200 years ago that I think have the power to help, really help us evaluate how or whether we've attempted to master divinity and know about God, or if we actually are close to Jesus. Like, there's a difference between knowing about and meeting Jesus. Because when you have communion with Christ, when you meet Jesus, there's an actual change that happens. A difference in knowledge and love, and God has this way of comforting and loving and teaching and leading us. 
A certain caveat, though, if you start comparing notes here. Uh, one reason why these are actually really fun questions to ask, because everybody answers the questions differently. Like, there's no, like, right answer to any of these diagnostic questions. What's fascinating about all the stories we've heard about people meeting the resurrected Jesus is that each story is different. Like, even in the stories we've just told, Jesus takes different approaches to different hearts and temperaments. Like there are no two people who have the same story about encountering the Lord. There's no like five steps to a, a teleconvincing story about this. Like even in the stories we've told, he, Jesus comes to Mary and Thomas calls him by name, speaks in person. John, Peter, they, they just, they're left by themselves by a gravesite trying to figure stuff out. Jesus has this way of giving each of us what we need, when we need it, and that means every story is differently. Jesus knocks the Apostle Paul flat with a blinding light, and a, he just yells at him. But he gently whispers the name Mary. In the Gospel of John, there's this, there's this line where Peter, if you hear last week, you heard this story, Peter hears the Lord say, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, talks about Peter's future. And Peter points at some of the other disciples, go, what's going to happen to that guy? And Jesus doesn't tell him. What Jesus says is, what is that to you? You, Peter, must follow me. You must follow me. So today is about meeting the Lord, whatever that looks like. So today, this service, please don't compare yourself to other people. When we take communion, please don't look around the room. Don't think about what other people are thinking. Don't miss out on whatever God has for you this morning. Because meeting Jesus will change your life. This morning, as Hebrews 12 says, I think we're called to fix our eyes on Jesus and run whatever path he may have uniquely set out for you. So, Father in heaven, my prayer is that throughout the service, in the moments ahead, as we sing songs about your suffering, as we take the elements of communion and meditate both on your love for us and our relationship with you, Father, in the words and moments and silence that will take up the rest of this service, may you be very profoundly real to us. Can you connect with us? Can you convict us? Can you comfort us? Can you give us assurances? Can you help us feel your love for us? Can you convict us of how we ought to live our lives in a way that honors you more? More than anything else this morning, Father, I pray that you'd help us to meet Jesus in a way that changes everything. I ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.